That's my business card. Um, it has got my email address on there though, hasn't it? Has it got it? Uh, yes. Yep. So that, that can you just email me any links to that or the one that you've already got is fine. Yeah, okay, no, no worries. Um, that should be fine. Um, so I'm, I think this will be about 15, 20 minutes, if that's okay? Yeah, good. Okay. So I guess the first question I'm interested to hear about is sort of in general, I, I guess you got involved in politics back in 2009? Is that correct? Uh, no. Later, oh, okay. Later than, well, it was the Auckland mayoral campaign, really, okay. which was 2010, wasn't it? Yeah, although were you not involved in, I think, stuff related to referenda before that? Y yes, although I wouldn't have called that involved in politics. Oh, okay, fair <laughs> I, what I did, um, when there was the referendum, oh no, the, my first involvement with anything political was the Willeke Homes crisis. Oh, okay. So, if we're just tracking back for a moment, um, business-wise, I have over a thousand clients with Leaky Homes, and it was clear that it was a major, major stuff up. Um, and so we became a little bit politically involved, I guess, as a business, because we had all these people with homes that were falling down in a government that wanted to know nothing about it, despite having signed off the certificates to say these things were good for 50 years. That was really the first thing. Um, then there was the referendum on the anti-smacking law where, you know, you had 80-whatever percent of people saying don't have an anti-smacking law and the government went ahead and did it anyway, which I, I think is really bad for democracy. I, I think you have a public referendum with an overwhelming result and to ignore it is a very bad thing for a country. And that probably, that was me becoming slowly more politically aware. And then we had the amalgamation of Auckland Super City, which was something that we dealt with council all the time, all the different councils. And I guess I took the time to personally do some research and figured out Super Cities were not the way to ensure good representation, nor were they going to save anybody money nor would they necessarily result in a fairer and better society. So for me, that sort of grandiose scheme of a super city was flawed from the very beginning. Um, and so therefore I got involved in that debate, which led to me standing as a candidate in the mural campaign. So that was the beginning, yeah, back in 2009, 2010. And uh, from when you first got involved, say, in the mayoral campaign, um, until the present, what things about political life has surprised you and which things were you sort of expecting and you were in fact correct about? Well, I guess because I had no background in politics, not long I come from a political family or anything like that, so I kind of approached politics fairly open-minded in many ways. Um, I didn't know what to expect. Of course I voted, I thought voting was essential. Um, I believe in a democracy and I believe in participating in that democracy. So for me, um, the process was interesting. I didn't have one set political allegiance or anything like that, um, nor did my family. Um, her, although I remember some good political debates between my, my dad and his sister at <laughs> one particular time. Um, got fairly heated. Uh, so for me, I didn't come in with a lot of expectations about what it would or wouldn't be about. I think I brought in, though, an expectation that people would have some level of respect for each other, that, that this was important stuff. You're talking about the way things are governed, the way rules are made. You're talking about the big decisions that can affect everyone's life. Therefore, uh, there needs to be some sense of, because it's such an important task, we need to go about it in a way that respects that importance. And I come from a reasonably proper sort of an upbringing where, you know, everyone has a chance to talk and you try and assess people's arguments on merit as opposed to, you know, whether they're wearing a blue colour or a red colour in terms of a jacket or something like that. In terms of um, sort of going with those expectations and, and also with your... Uh emphasis on representation. Um, do you think that since your, since 2010 um, New Zealand has moved to a better spot in terms of representation and fair politics or do you think it has gotten worse? Oh, I think it's definitely gotten worse. No question in my mind about that. Um, well, hey look, 
We had the anti-smacking referenda. Government just ignored it. Well, then we had a referendum on the sale of state assets. Government just ignored it. I mean, every time the people of the country make the effort to get a referendum together to tell government what needs to happen, and government ignores it. In my mind, democracy goes backwards. So we've had a couple of instances of that. Um, we've also had this problem with, um, I would say, um, dirty politics, which is this sort of rise of the bloggers. People who have no ethics in media, they simply have a target and they go after the target to take them out purely for political gain or to manipulate the system. And I think that's definitely, I mean, those, those number of bloggers has increased and some of the vitriol and so forth has increased over that period of time as well. So I would consider that um, definitely something that shows that we've gone backwards and well as well in terms of our political debate. And of course you've got declining participation in terms of um, voting, although we did have a little bit of a resurgence in the last election in terms of numbers voting. But to my mind, the trend is a bad trend. I think we're heading towards less participation, people being more cynical, people playing more and more political game, rather than going back to those sort of ethics and values where democracy is all about giving everybody a voice and representing that. Do you think that the political parties, the major ones, so um, ACT, National Labour, the Greens, do you think they, uh, New Zealand First, do you think they are a part of the problem in terms of uh, this, uh, this uh, ideal sort of politics, or do you think um, that they're, they're more the um, sort of receiving end of other uh, factors? Well, I think uh, I wouldn't label ACT a major political party. Okay, <laughs> but, but look, um, as far as National and Labour go, they've both been guilty of ignoring referendums. They've both basically said to the people, no, stuff you. We think our view is more important than what you, the voters, voting as one huge block, think. I mean, those are the parties that will accept that people are intelligent enough at an election to make them government, but then are not intelligent enough to make another decision like whether we sell state assets or not. So to my mind, both National and Labour have got um, an ethos within them that I think is, is deconstructible, harmful to democracy, and that's the idea of, well, we're the boss and we just call it how we see it. And I think that's got to change. Now, I don't think that's as prevalent in, in minor parties, probably because minor parties need to be listening more to be able to win support. But certainly, as far as the two big parties are concerned, both of them have a track record of ignoring what people are saying. Do you think that the major political parties um, are somewhat guilty for the dirty politics side of things in terms of feeding that, or do you think they're sort of bystanders? It's an interesting question. I would say that they are beneficiaries of it. How much they are involved in instigating it or not, I think, um, is a very tough question to answer. How much do they encourage it uh, is a tough question to answer. And I don't pretend to have the answer to that. I think there's some documentary ev evidence in Nikki Hager's book about um, entitled Dirty Politics. I think there's some evidence in that that there is um, at least a passive working relationship between some bloggers and government. Of course people who are political activists are going to find ways to support parties, and blogging is a natural outlet of that. So I think as the internet and social media gains more and more significance, I think we'll see more and more active involvement by those main parties, rather than passive involvement. So I think that's probably the danger of where we're headed. The danger of where we're headed is that that social networking, that social media, enables one, two, three activists who are very dedicated to actually start making a bigger and bigger impact and I guess distort the message that your ordinary person is getting, especially when mainstream media, which it is now doing, is looking to the social media and to those bloggers to lead the news. You know, as your staffing numbers are cut down within your main media organisations, as they've got to do more and more on less and less, they're more likely to rely, as has happened in my case, 
you know, bloggers have made some outrageous allegation, mainstream media have picked it up. They've gone, oh gosh, that's the news. And so they start printing it. And so I think there's risks around that. And I think parties will in the future probably, if they can get away with it, probably utilise it more and more because it is having an effect. And that's the sad thing is it does have an impact. It does have an effect. So therefore it's very tempting for the main parties to get into it. In terms of, because one of the things that some would argue is that the sort of independent media or the sort of the blogosphere or whatever is a helps with democracy, but it sounds like you think it, it potentially is harmful to democracy, is that a fear? I think it is harmful to democracy when it is not seen for what it is. So if people look at it and go, hey, here's a political activist who's stating their point of view, you're fine. Everyone understands it's a political activist stating their point of view. However, when that political activist gets to write the story and mainstream media, TV news, radio news picks up on that and then starts publishing it, even if it's wrong, which has happened in my case, that's quite serious because that is changing democracy. It's giving people a false message. And it's a false message that's ultimately come from a political activist who doesn't have any journalistic ethics. So for me, I think that is a real danger and I think that does pervert democracy when that happens. Um, do you think that... Um, I know there have been some moves from some people in the blogging community to get journalistic accreditation. Do you think that's sort of a, a positive element or do you think they're trying to sort of pave over their agendas to some degree? I'm not sure I've got an absolute opinion on that. I mean, my view is... Uh, people should be able to express their opinions freely. I'm a great believer in free speech. I think, however, it's important that um, people are accountable, accountable for that free speech. So if having journalistic accreditation makes them more accountable for what they do, I'm all in favour of that. Um, I mean, what I'm doing, the people that have gone out and defamed me, I'm taking a legal action. That's expensive to do. It's slow and it's, uh, you know, it's prohibitive for some people. And I've heard from a number of people in the last week or two who have contacted me with their personal stories where they've had somebody go out, slam them in the media. They haven't had the resources to do anything about it. They have to live with it. In one particular case, this was detrimental to the person's life for years. And that's inherently unjust. So, look, anything that will improve the quality or accountability of what people say, in my view, is a good thing. So the suits you're taking are, you see it as a sort of form of holding people accountable? It is, exactly. Exactly what it is. If people go out there and lie about somebody, uh, that's not a, a legal thing to do. It's not an ethically right thing to do. Um, and depending on the nature of those lies, it can be quite a harmful thing to do, um, which it has been in my case. So that uh, the provision is there in the law already and I'm taking advantage of that but there are people who wouldn't have the financial resources to do that and that's where I think anything that can improve the quality or accountability of media is a good thing. I'm not saying people shouldn't be able to have an opinion and express it, I think that's part, an important part of a democracy but that needs to be an opinion and if they're going to talk about other people they need to be accurate it can't just be attack politics where we go and make stuff up about people because we want to shoot them down. Um, on that point, um, are, the, are the suits um, against the uh, three activists I think you've named, um, do you see, are those suits ongoing at the moment? Well, we're working on them in terms of um, the legal cases. Uh, just to give you an example, of the sheer, and, and this is the thing, our defamation laws in this country are really written to deal with someone who writes one article to defame and, and gets it wrong and says something inappropriate about someone that defames them. We're talking about, in this particular case, two bloggers who have gone post after post after post. So I was looking at reviewing one document this morning, it's over 200 pages long of stuff that this person has decided they will write about me. Um, 
that's it's unheard of really and it's unprecedented but i think it gives you some idea of um why we're taking time to get those court cases in place because it's a lot of material um in terms of uh your your thoughts on the case in your view the the allegations made by these um these three individuals were entirely false is that is that my understanding uh, essentially yeah um I mean, they've, take for example one particular blogger, Mr Stringer, who's, as I say, we're looking at his blog site. We've got over 200 pages of material. There are so many allegations. Uh, what we've got to do is we've got to select, well, what are the big ones and what are the damaging ones? And those are the ones that we'll hold into account on. It's simply not possible to go through everything that he's written and attempt to correct it all. I'm going to take forever. So... What we've got to do is we've got to go for the big points and say, here are your key allegations, and this is why they're wrong. Um, I guess one of the things which sort of is an is an element of of a representative democracy is is both the the electorate and also those who are elected. Yes. Um, one of the things which many have concerns about in New Zealand, not to pick on New Zealand particularly, um, because it's, it's the case in many countries, but is, is the representation of certain minorities in, in Parliament, and, um, and also um, of the a, a important majority of women hmm. uh, are, are at a, um, they are not represented uh, equally. Do you feel that that's something that needs to be addressed? Well, that's one of the reasons I like a proportional system, because a proportional system does enable you to have sort of more specialist groups getting represented. Now, in New Zealand, our threshold's too high. Uh, our threshold is 5%. So essentially, um, you'd have to have 120,000 people all vote for the same party for them to get representation. Now, we got essentially 100,000 party votes, so we got 4%. We're not in Parliament. That's a lot of people who are not represented in our Parliament. Now, we're a Conservative Party, so we're, we're representing Conservative values. But you could equally imagine um, it could be the case with a party, maybe maybe a religious party, or maybe a party that's set up for a ethnic minority. And in fact, if you look back at the Royal Commission that reviewed our electoral system, they originally recommended a 4% threshold, and they suggested that it needed to be looked at to make sure that it was allowing representation of minorities who may wish to have a voice in our parliamentary system. So I think what's happened is the good intentions of our proportional system have been hijacked by the large parties who have said, well, we don't actually want anyone else to be able to play this game, so let's make the threshold higher than it should be. Even in the review that they've just carried out after the last election, it was very clear that the recommendation was to lower it to 4% and to stop coattailing. Neither of those two things have been implemented. It simply doesn't suit the, the party in power at the moment. So your, your opinion is that the, the system should be strictly proportional? Or? I like it being strictly proportional. I'd love to see the threshold lower than it should be, uh, lower than it is at the moment. It's 5% at the moment. Recommendation is 4%. I'd be comfortable with it going as low as, say, 3 <clears throat> If you think about 3%, it's still 60,000 people. So it's not going to distort the system with, you know, oh, we've got 5,000 people who create an issue. It's not going to happen. 60,000 people is a good number of people. In my view, that deserves representation. So we were comfortable with recommending in our submission 3%. I think 4% is a good start in the right direction, though. And a proportional system does enable minor minorities to get representation. And in fact, they can become extremely influential in terms of making up the balance of power. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, I had a feeling from some of the stuff I had read about your, um, your campaigning and, and some of the views you had had on, for example, how I think John Key had represented the public on a few matters. Um, you seem to suggest that there was, you, you like the idea of a, an electorate being represented by an MP. Is, is that a fair representation of what you currently feel? Yeah, I do like 
a, a, connect, a real connection between parliamentarians and people. So for me, um, I've always thought that I, I stand locally. I like to stand where I live so that people can meet me on the street and go, oh, yeah, look, um, do this or do that. I, I feel that's a real connection. I think we can play democracy as a game, and I don't like it. I think that's not genuine. I think what's genuine is when someone can talk to their representative face to face and go, hey, I wanted you to vote this way on this. Um, I'm now asking you why you didn't. So I think that that real connection, person to person, is very, very important for a democracy. And yes, I do like people to live and in their area and represent people who are genuinely their neighbours. So you, you would not be in favour of removing electorates? No, I, I wouldn't. Um, I do think you need some level of electoral representation, some connection to people doesn't mean it doesn't rule out lowering the threshold at all. Um, it doesn't mean that you won't have a proportional element, because I believe in a proportional element so your minorities and so on can be represented. But it does mean that at heart you've still got a connection between parliamentarians and the people that they are voting for. One of the things which I think was your view at least a few years ago, I'm not sure what your current thoughts on it are, but um, was that you were, I believe, advocating for the Maori electorates to be removed. Yeah. Um, do you think that Maori electorates could play the, a similar role to um, geographical or, or, or the, the uh, I guess, normal electorates mm. um, in terms of having a connection between um, elected representative and, and the people they're representing? Yeah, so um, first of all, going, going just strictly the first question, whether we should have separate Maori electorates. Sure. Uh, I don't believe we should. Historically, New Zealand did have special electorates for Maori and special electorates for miners. Um, that's people who were mining gold, oh, yeah. um, not young people. Uh, so, obviously, we no longer have any special representation for people engaged in the occupation of mining. Um, we still have this hangover of the Maori seats. The Royal Commission that looked into our electoral system said we should not divide the nation on the basis of race. I would, I'm would. i fully supportive of having a Maori party. I have no problem with that whatsoever, but I believe that it should seek to be represented proportionally in Parliament um, and that we should do away with seats that are based, strictly race-based seats. I'm, I'm not a supporter of that. I think they're going to go anyway. If we look, just look, at, the, look at the facts, um, less and less Maori are signing up on the Maori roll. I mean, we spent five million dollars to try and get people to sign up on it, and still a majority are signing up on the general roll. So I think it's inevitable that they're going to disappear. They are a historical oddity, and I think the sooner we're all voting on the same electoral roll as one nation, the better off we'll be. So you wouldn't accept arguments that the cultural divides that might exist might be reason to have the separate electorates? I think the cultural divides that may exist would be a reason to have a different party that campaigns on a proportional basis. Uh, no problem with that. Um, but no, I don't believe that we should geographically divide um, Maori into a box here and a box there and a box somewhere else. Um, stepping, stepping back to something I was asking a bit earlier, do you think there's, um, in terms in terms of um, voices in Parliament, do you think there's a need to for either political parties or systematically for there to be a way for there to be more of a voice, a female voice in Parliament? I think the, uh, I think in terms of who we have in Parliament, at the moment, not not purely female representation, but representation of a number of different causes, a number of different ways of thinking and ethoses, we have a very narrow approach in terms of how Parliament looks at the moment. I would describe it like this. Essentially, you have at the top of the large parties a group of spokespeople. Maybe it's five, there or thereabouts. Pretty much everyone else is just a, a vote to support what those five are doing. I think that's less than what Parliament should be. I'd almost use the word demeaning. I think it is a little bit demeaning. I think we deserve a little bit more than that. We, everybody goes in there knowing that they've got a, a role to play, 
that they are genuinely representing people. And we'd, we'd see a lot more diversity in reality uh, if we had people going in there proportionally representing um, their maybe their ethnicity, maybe their religious views, whatever. I don't mind. I'm, I'm, I'm quite comfortable with that. I think that that's what democracy should be about, uh, where you've got a, a range of voices and a range of views. I think that leads to much better representation in the end than having, well, we have a two-party system still, really, where the government is dominated by one party or the other, and the decisions and the way that party goes are largely dictated by a few at the top. That, to me, is not ideal democracy. In terms of the party's behaviour, so, so with the major parties, in your view, there's, there's a sort of elite of the party who essentially run the show. Is that, is that a sort of...? Pretty much. I mean, I would, I would uh, put it this way. Um, when was the last time that people in political parties crossed the floor in New Zealand on an issue which was of, you know, someone in their party put forward? You know, you have a party vote, you've got everyone standing in line going, gosh, we're voting with the party. The idea of independent thought, the idea of crossing the floor on uh, to oppose something your own party has proposed, that just doesn't happen anymore. No one would do it, it'd be the end of their political career, because we are seeing a far more structured, we are a group, we will group think this, and we will all block vote this through approach. Again, I mean, I would point to how many times we've used urgency as a mechanism to push legislation through in the last six years. Very disappointing. More than ever before. Why? Was it because the legislation was more urgent? No. It was just a way to essentially bypass good debate and push through legislation that the ruling government wanted through. And I think that's disappointing. It's not what it should be. That should be used on a rare occasion for something that genuinely gets hung up in the process not be a mechanism for getting through your own agenda. Um, moving on to another thing that you're um, engaged with at the moment. Um, so a few days ago, there was allegations of electoral mm. fraud, I mm. understand. Um, I believe Mr. Stringer... Add, yeah, add that, add that to the list, that's right. Um, I mean, firstly, I, I, I understand you're denying those allegations Absolutely. outright. Um, Absolutely. Uh, my wife and I had an interesting discussion. We sat down and we said, OK, what haven't we been accused of yet? I haven't yet been accused of assassinating anybody, nor have I been accused of being an illegal alien. So we came up with a couple of things. But look, these guys have got a list as long as my arm now. Um, it, it really, I think, those allegations, which had been put to a media outlet um, last week, the media outlet asked me questions. They didn't think there was a story in it. So I think what's happened is Mr String has gone ahead with a public announcement because he couldn't get um, the story taken seriously any other way. And I think that's disappointing. Um, these things properly, if he had a concern, he should have eight months ago gone to the Electoral Commission and um, raised the issue then, and they would have looked into it. That's the proper process. Announcing publicly that somebody has been guilty of a whole lot of misdoing before the questions have even been asked, I think most people understand that's dirty politics. So in you're not at all concerned about that? Not at all, not at all. I just look at it as more of the same thing. These are just allegations put out there to smear my reputation. Uh, but at the end of the day, the Electoral Commission will look into them, and I'm really very confident that they'll be quite happy with the way that I filed my return. Do you believe that the limits put in place um, are appropriate in terms of the law? Um, I think they probably are. Um, winning votes is an expensive business. There's no question about that. Uh, getting a message across to the nation is, is not a cheap thing to do. I think my concern is more that the taxpayer money gets given to the two large parties, enabling them to do far more. Whereas as a small party, we got virtually nothing and have to fund it ourselves. I think my, my wish would be that we had a system that rewarded or incentivised or paid parties on the basis of the number of votes received, not on um, other sort of vague type 
um, ways of assessing it. So from my perspective, I don't think the limits are a problem, but I do think the way that we currently fund political activity using taxpayer money is. Do you, um, do you generally feel, um, because of course the Conservatives as the Mana Party in the, um, in the past several cycles has had a good amount of, uh, a large amount of, of uh, funds being spent on those campaigns. Do you feel that the, there, is a, there is a bit of a um, conflict between personal funds used in politics and democracy? Personally, I don't. Um, I think people are going to contribute or make um, their effort to influence debate and democracy in many ways. Some people will have more time, and so they'll go out and campaign in the local shopping centre. Now, I don't have that time. I wish I did. Um, other people may have a big network of friends, so they may be very connected on Facebook. So if they go out there and say, hey, vote for a certain party, they've got a wider influence because of that. Some people have more money in their pocket, and so they can afford to pay for more advertisements, for example. I don't think there's any problem with that myself. I think what is really clear, if you look at the last campaign, particularly the Internet Mana campaign, which had a lot of money spent on it, spending money doesn't win you a vote, doesn't win you votes, and it doesn't win you an election. At the end of the day, you've still got to genuinely convince people that your policies are ones they will support. So you don't feel that in a New Zealand context money tends to swamp out voices? Too? No, I, I really don't think it does. In fact, I think probably um, the evidence points the other way. Money, it's helpful, but it's not going to win your votes. Um, it might get your message out, and that's important. Everyone needs to be able to get their message out. But I would much rather see um, a sort of a much bigger um, platform put out there where you know, websites, and, and one of the TV, I think might have, I, I can't remember which television station did it, but one of them actually ran a thing where people could log in and pick the policies they liked, and that gave them a, some idea of which parties aligned with those policies. Those sorts of things, that was a tool that had been taken from Canada, where it had been very effective. I like those sorts of things, because you don't have to spend, parties don't have to spend money, there's actually something there for the voter to help guide them to which party might be representative of them. So oh, I, I like anything like that that's going to save time and cost and help voters out. To me, those things are good initiatives. And that was done purely um, without government funds, purely by the television network, and I thought that was a great initiative. Certainly, I think most notably in the United States, there, there are lots of concerns about money and politics Mm. Um, do you think New Zealand is at risk of eventually ending up with a similar situation? Are we at risk eventually? I think, I think the more centralised your politics becomes, the less people participate, the higher the risk lobby groups, well-funded lobby groups, can capture politics and start getting legislation their own way. And I think we should always be vigilant about that. I think... For a democracy to function, and to function well, people need to know what it is, and they need to be committed to ensuring that it keeps going in a healthy way. I mean, the, the states, we are not at the level the states is at yet. I mean, if you look at voter participation in states, it's less than half. We, we've still got more than, I mean, 60-70% participation in New Zealand. It is falling. Oh, is there a risk we could end up there? Yeah, there is a risk. Let's be honest, of course there's a risk. If people get more cynical and they see governments that don't listen, they'll give up voting. And the less people that participate and the more um, there is to gain for, say, large corporate interests, the more they'll lobby. And I think you see that to an extreme in the States, but I think we could end up there and maybe we've gone a bit too far that way already. Uh, and finally... Um what what do you hope will result from the current uh, so, uh, sort of saga? And uh, do you, are you, yeah. in, in say a year's time, where are you hoping things will end mm. up? Well, maybe I'll answer that in two ways. First of all, for me personally, um, I'm looking to get judgments from the court to clear my name. That's very important for me. 
Um, I got into politics purely on the basis of wanting to help and represent people. I don't have a particular ambition or agenda personally. I have a wonderful life and I'm really happy with it. But I do feel I can give back and, and my wife and I are committed to that. So I guess first and foremost, ideally we would see court judgments that say, look, actually Mr Craig was telling the truth about these things. These other guys weren't and so they're held accountable for that. So I think that's the first thing. Um, beyond that, it's interesting because what will I do and what will my role be in politics? I don't actually know. But the second thing I'd hope to achieve, this first one being clearing my own name, that's important for me and for my family and friends. The second thing I would hope is that maybe we make a contribution towards a cleaner type of politics. That by holding people to account who do pursue defamatory tactics, we might deter people from doing that again. Not just these same people, but others who might be tempted to go down that route who might be tempted to use dirty politics and attacked politics to use that as a way to promote a political agenda. They might rethink that and go, you know what, no, let's play this fair because there's penalties attached to breaking the rules. I would like to think we might be able to make a difference towards having a cleaner style of politics and a better type of debate. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great.